do you get when a legless lad and a blind bloke walk into a bar? A couple of mates on a mission to challenge what it means to be tough. Welcome back to Talkin' Tough. Um, I'm Mike, joined by my great mate Ben. We're a couple of mates who realise that we're better friends when we're leaning on each other during tough stuff. This podcast is only possible thanks to Ski for Life, an incredible Aussie charity dedicated to promoting mental health, well-being, and suicide prevention. All things that, let's be honest, touch us in one way or another in life. The best way to make a difference is by talking about it, and that's what we're here to do, mate. Absolutely it is, and uh, we are out to redefine what it means to be tough, and as we're workshopping uh, throughout this podcast series, uh, the talking tough definition of being tough is being able to be honest and, and speak up when you are going through hardship or pain. And, and that's something that we'll continue to work on, we'll continue to flesh out, and we'll continue to do it together um, with everyone out there. It certainly is. And today I'm so uh, pumped. Um, are you? Today I am pumped, yeah, yeah awesome. absolutely, because I get to talk to you, my main man. Um, I get to talk to you about your story. Um, I've heard it plenty of times, but I, I, I must be honest, uh, it's something that I, I can never uh, quite wrap my head around what it would be like. Um, and I'm really, really keen to, to deep dive into it, talk about um, some of your challenges, um, and also more importantly, um, how you dealt with it and how you maintain uh, the motivation that you have. I know you very well. You're a very motivated driven individual um, and it's going to be really beneficial for not only me as it always is uh, but for the audience to hear a little bit about what it takes to overcome the unthinkable. Mate, hit me. Hit ya. Well, hit me with your best shot first as they of all, say. <laughs> uh, I think it's really good to set a bit of context, understand a little bit about Ben and who Ben Pettingill is but before we do that I'd love to hear about, um, you know, obviously the, the full circle. Uh, we'll get to what you've learned uh, through the journey and through your journey, uh, but the full circle meaning that what was life like uh, as a young whippersnapper, um, you know, growing up uh, in Melbourne, um, you know, I want to hear more about that, but more importantly, I want to hear um, what were some of the perceptions you had around what it made, what, what, what made somebody tough? What was, your, what was your idea of tough growing up, buddy? Uh, footy players definitely come to yep, mind. Absolutely. Uh, so they, Who were your toughest footy players? Well, Give us a few. I always remember my old man yeah. uh, because he was he was uh, Fitzroy supporter but always used to talk about the good old days. Back yeah. in the good old days yeah, yeah. when footy used yeah. to be full of tough blokes and, and whatnot. Was. And there used to be Lee Matthews and there used to be blokes like this and that that would just take hit after hit after hit. Yeah. And like when, when I'd be watching footy going, oh, nah, they used to be tougher back in my day. Yeah. Back when we used to go down to the local oval and watch VFL, that's when that's when you'd see the big hits. That's when the real tough blokes used to play footy. So that was one side of tough. Uh, and then the culprit that was telling me that um, was probably my other version of tough, uh, my emotionless father. I shouldn't say emotionless <laughs> because he's uh, he does have emotions. Matter but of fact. Uh, I've managed to crack him later in life. But growing up, it was coming home in his, uh, his high-vis, uh, he... Timmy's a plumber and he would have his couch, uh, his single single armchair in the corner of the lounge room. Uh, we were too scared to sit on that. That was dad's yeah. couch. Yeah. And uh, it was very much, oh, well, is what it is. Uh, no point talking about it. No, no point complaining about it. Let's just get on with it. Yeah. And, and it was just wipe your hands, keep moving on. And that was tough. Um, to me, it was, it uh, doesn't matter what comes your way. Nothing's too big. Nothing's too hard. You just... Do whatever you can to get through it, and and you don't sort of stop to acknowledge how it felt, what impact it had. Uh, you just sweep it under the rug and yeah. get on with it. Would you say that sort of rubbed off on you as a kid as well? Like you know, you'd you'd get up, you wouldn't like you you, you know. For instance, you're a young fella, you look up to your old man. He's your definition of toughness, and you fall over and you take a chunk out of your knee. Would I'm going a, to mum. I am yeah, not telling dad. Right, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so so you, you bypass him because, you know, getting up and, and showing emotion or showing any weakness was probably, probably uh, you know, a, a bit taboo when it came to your dad. Mate, there was times there mm. where I'm out the back, in the backyard, yeah. going, oh, I reckon if I, if I lean down on the concrete here and scratch my elbow on it a little bit, it might, it might scar a little bit and my, um, my arms and my might get some calluses on my hand because I always used to – when I was real young or when, uh, when dad was in a good mood and, and let us sit on his lap once he got home from work and sort of say good day and whatnot, or if I'd have an arm wrestle with him, he had the big calloused hands. And yeah, the, you wouldn't be like him. Uh, and, and you go, that's, that's tough. So 
I'm out the back rubbing my hands on the on the concrete or the rubbing rocks together to yeah. try and get calloused hands to be as tough as dad. That's awesome. Looked up to him though. But I know you, you know, that, that, that's, that doesn't surprise me at all because you and your dad are, uh, are very close. Oh, best You mates. go away uh, a lot together. Um, you are, you know, um, very, very similar in many ways, but very different in many ways too. You probably get a bit of your mum on you too, so she rubs off. Thank, thankfully, the, that's the case. Not, uh, nice balance, hopefully. Yeah, ha- hopefully. Yeah, I think there's definitely a nice balance there. But I think, um, you know, when it comes to growing up in, you know, your household, um, you know, talk us, talk us through, uh, you know, some of the things that, um, you know, were formative in your years. What were sort of, sort of things that made Ben Pettingill tick and whereabouts did you, you know, you sort of, you know, start your journey? Yeah, so... Uh, born and bred our outside of Melbourne and probably dad more than anything uh, ingrained in me a belief that if we were to go anywhere it was away from the city Uh, so every chance we got throughout my childhood was camping fishing shooting hunting whatever water skiing getting out and about getting outdoors great outdoors yeah but it was uh, because my old man in construction uh, in the commercial side of things worked in the city and, and his love of the outdoors and camping and whatnot, every chance we got, weekends, everything like that, holidays, summer, winter, didn't matter, rain, hail or shine, we were heading away from the city, into the bush, up to the river, into the high country and, and we were just getting out and about in nature and, and getting into it and that, is, that definitely rubbed off on me. Uh, that, was, that was definitely, along with sport, along with my mates, uh, along with that, that typical sort of uh, stuff that is just part and parcel of growing up uh, as a young fella. It was very much about every chance we could getting out um, and getting outdoors and just just loving that side of love life. A, love a bit of fishing, mate. Water love, skiing, love my fishing, love yep. my water skiing. Like I absolutely, just said. Um, you know, and 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 your footy and 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 going. I love that. I like going the opposite direction to the city. You know, uh, you know, if you do uh, nick off, uh, if you do, you know. To, your dad's version of fun, I guess you could say, was to just you know totally just hightail it, uh, be with his family, but uh, be be amongst nature. Mm. Yeah, something you do you do pretty regularly now. Oh, as much as we possibly can. Yeah, uh, life changes, uh, but it is definitely still a priority for for both myself, uh, whether it's with my old man, whether it's with my wife and my daughter, yeah. as much as I possibly can, even if it's just for a day, yeah. uh, even if it's just for an overnight. It doesn't have to be a whole week or a couple of weeks or whatever, just making sure we've actually just recently now, um, because we haven't done it enough, gone through the calendar for the next 12 months and put in a weekend every six weeks or so to make sure that we go camping because it's one of those things that has been missing for probably a little bit too long. Yeah, 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 absolutely, mate. Um, Benny, growing up, um, every young young fella has dreams and ambitions uh, about what they'll do when they're older. Talk us through that, mate. What, would, what did you want to do? What was your, what was your sort of like, yeah, you know, the, 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 the best thing you could possibly aspire to? What did you want to do career-wise? It was, it was pretty set in concrete for me. It was yep. pretty simple because of my love of the outdoors, love of the country, love of the bush. Uh, it was a combination of that. And also my grandpa and my dad, um, they were also uh, big into their planes. So okay. grandpa worked for Qantas, old man, he flew, he had his pilot's license before he had his car license because of the cost, um, couldn't continue with it, ended up a plumber instead of a pilot. Yeah. <laughs> but for me, that love of the sky through them, uh, combined with my love of the bush, uh, settled me on becoming a helicopter pilot, but more specifically a mustering helicopter pilot was my absolute dead set dream. So Yeah, right. So you're a uh, so you're 16-year-old, um, you've got these set in concrete you know what you want to do which is unusual for a 16 year old so that's really you know amazing that you've got you know exactly what you want to be doing when you're older uh talk us through that 16 year old ben uh what happens next well mate shit it's the shit it's the fan to be completely honest and it happened bloody quick so to paint the picture i'm sitting up the back of my classroom and at school year 10 and looking at the diagram the teacher's drawing on the board and something doesn't seem quite right about this diagram. I'm turning to my best mate, Stu, beside me saying, hey, Stu, does that diagram on the board, does that look blurry to you? And he's like, mate, what do you mean by blurry? I'm saying, well, it's just shimmering a little bit. It's a little bit hazy, like it's just not quite right. And he's going, mate, it is as clear as day. What are you talking about? Uh, it, is, it is fine. I'm saying, but it's, it's not fine. It's not quite right. And uh, we sort of went backwards and forwards. He's like, no, nah, I'm not seeing what you're saying. I'm like, well, I mean... I can't shake it. I'm not just noticing it here. It's now in my textbook. It's now on my phone. It's now outside the classroom after class. And I just had that 
that sort of weird feeling that we get sometimes that you, you can't sort of put your finger on exactly what it is, but you just know something's not quite right. And I thought, right, I better just run this past uh, mum and dad. Now, I went to dad first. Dad, a little bit more relaxed than mum when it comes to these sort of things and giving advice and guidance and whatnot. So ran the situation past the old man and pretty simply he's just going, oh, well, mate, we'll just wait and see what happens. Like, no big deal. And I trusted dad. That's exactly what I did. I thought that was great advice. <laughs> yeah, bloody oath, yeah. And, uh, and typical from Timmy. Oh, absolutely. Very typical yeah. from a tough bloke. Yeah. Like, let's not overthink it. Yeah, she'll Let, be right. Let's not overcomplicate yeah. it. Let's not worry about it because worrying about it means emotions. Uh, let's, and you think uh, you, went, you went to your, your old man as opposed to your mum because, you know, you, 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 you wanted the reassurance and in a way, like, you'll be right. Like, is that, is that, 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 is that the kind of answer you may be looking for? Probably in hindsight. Yeah. Well, if, if not even that answer, uh, just someone that was, wasn't going to make it bigger than what it needed to be yeah, sure. at, at that yeah. point in time. I thought yeah. he's just going to tell it like it is black and white um, and, and that's going to be as simple as it is. Now, I trusted his, his advice. Uh, I thought, you know what? If my old man's not worried about it, I'm not going to worry about it. This is going to be sweet. Only problem was, without me knowing, my old man, he then rings my mum. Ugh. Now, a mistake that he made, now I shouldn't say it was a mistake, it was probably the right thing to do. Uh, I think he regretted it at the, at the time because I now know that conversation between mum and dad didn't go down too well when Timmy's telling my mum, oh, well, I've just spoken to Ben. Everything's a little bit blurry at school, but don't worry, sweetheart. I've got it under control. I've told him not to worry about it. So, well, how do you think that goes down with mum? Yeah, right. My mum, world's biggest stress head, like has an amazing ability to turn little things into big things and uh, that's exactly what she did. So dad's now under strict instruction from mum. He's had to leave work and uh, she's giving him directions, what to do, where to be, go to school, pick up Ben, we're going to meet you back here, I'm going to tell you where to park, what to do, all this sort of stuff. And Dad's like, I probably shouldn't have rung. Anyway, I don't know any of this is happening, right? I'm at school, yep. minding my own business, not worrying about it like Dad and I have agreed. Just working out what's going on with the old peepers. That's it. Going, you know, I'm, well, I'm just, it's going to be fine. Dad's told me it's going to be fine. And it was only this tiny, tiny little bit blurry, right? I could still see the diagram. It's not yeah. like I'd lost my eyesight or anything. It was like having a, a tiny little headache, right? So I'm just getting on with my day and going, oh, I'm not even going to pay it any attention. Mm. And uh, all of a sudden, the PA system, the announcement, comes yeah. over the entire school, go and Ben, please come to the office with your school bag. Yeah. I'm like, what is going on here? I never got to leave school early. Parents were pretty strict like that. So I've... Uh, you would have been wrapped. Oh, I was pumped. <laughs> I, th I think I, th I thought whoever was picking me up, must have had something cool planned yeah. or there must have been a reason that I was getting out of there. You're uh, going fishing. <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> so I get to the office and the old man's there. He's already signed me out. I'm saying, Dad, what are we doing? Where are we going? I, by this point in time, mate, I'd completely forgotten about the conversation yeah. I'd had with him earlier yeah. because it was just such a non-issue. Yeah. The way he dismissed it of, sure. oh, well, don't worry about it. And he's like, mate, apparently according to your mother, I give yeah. very bad advice. Yeah. All right. So she's in charge now. Get in the car. We've got to go to hospital. We're going to go get it checked out. Uh, and uh, you, just just, uh, just participate, mate. Don't argue. Don't push back. It's going to be best for both of us if we just let mum do what she wants so to do. So your dad's a tough nut, but we've just discovered who's really in charge here. Well, I think he thought, you know what, this is going to be the easiest yeah, way yeah, through. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take her the uh, man, path too, of least resistance yeah. in, this, in this particular sure. scenario. Because at the end of the day, I'm uh, I'm their I'm their young boy, and they want to make th make sure things are okay, especially mum. So, uh, dad and I we're we're he heading into town, following mum's directions. Pull up at the I and E hospital in the middle of the city in Melbourne, and we head into the emergency department. Mum rocks up. We get all these different tests done. Doctors sit us down, and they say, "Guys, we've discovered what's going on. It's nothing serious." And dad's going, see, told you, told you yeah, there's nothing serious. Yeah. <laughs> and he's going, uh, the doctor's saying, now, Ben, what it is, it's an inflammation of your optic nerve, which is just the cord that joins your, your eye to your brain. So that's inflamed. It's bigger than it should be. What we're going to do is put you on a course of steroids. We'll keep you in overnight. We'll send you home in the morning. After a month, everything will be all good. Yeah, and easy fix. Well, absolutely. And with some hidden benefits, I thought. I mm. mean, my eyes lit yeah. up when I heard the word steroids. <laughs> <laughs> I'm picturing the end result going, 
This could be the best day of my entire life. Roids at 16. Jeez. Yeah. I mean, that's what dreams, and what was your, that's your, what dreams are made of, aren't they? Bloody oath, yeah. You would have been thinking Arnie and, you know, Sylvester Stallone. Well, I was turning to mum going, mum. Being damn. Did you hear that? Yeah, I know. Like, mum, this is, this is the best idea yeah. you have ever had. Like, oh, we should have so... come to hospital and got on these roids ages ago. Yeah. And uh, she's shaking her head. She's all embarrassed. Dad's just laughing going, <laughs> typical. And this doctor's shaking his head as well. Um, mate, I can see by the look in your eyes you've never heard of medical steroids. They will do nearly the complete opposite to what I can see you think they're going to do. However, they will make you better within a month. So uh, much, to, much to sort of my frustration that they weren't going to improve my uh, physical appearance in, in, the, in the muscle and the tone sense, I got taken up to the top level of the hospital, put in the hospital ward, into the bed, convinced mum and dad, don't worry about staying in overnight, I'll be fine. Head home. So come. just pre- just a precaution. Yeah, you just yeah. got to get you up there. What what did they do? They had to give you some sort of like drip or something like that. Well, yeah, they had to put the steroid drip in, and they also had to uh, just keep us in overnight to to get those steroids sort of pumping in, get the levels up, and then go home, and you'll just have tab- tablet steroids for the next month. So that's what we did up there. Like I said, convince mum and dad, go home, see you in the morning, and the nurse comes in, says, Ben, been a really long day, try and get some rest, there will be some noises, we'll come and check on you every now and then, but just try and rest as much as you possibly can. So she closed those sort of bluey green hospital curtains, I was in a room with 10 other beds. Jeez. Yeah, and uh, yeah, busy ward. Uh, and 10 uh, blokes, like you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have got much sleep, would you? <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> no, it wasn't, it, was, it wasn't great, but I did actually manage to get a decent night's sleep after eventually sort of winding down, I'll turn the TV off that hangs on that curtain rail at the end you know that that tv that all those hospital beds have and flick my mates and mum and dad a couple of messages just to say look everything's all good here i'll give the update in the morning i'll touch base then put my phone down close my eyes try to get some sleep and the next morning when i woke up and i opened my eyes and looked around for all those things that had been there the day before they were gone mate to be honest i'm looking to the bedside table beside me for my phone to check the time and it was gone I'm looking towards the end of the bed as my sort of eyes are adjusting and the TV's gone. Nothing that was there the night before was still there. I'm going, what the f- has just happened? Yeah. Like, it, this is I, – I, I don't get this. I, I was sort of in so shock. So you went from – so so it was just, we're just pitch black? What did it look like? Well, hard to remember um, but – I can, I can sort of describe what it's like now because essentially, not that I knew it then, yeah. but I just lost 98% of my eyesight overnight. So I'm going, I can't see the TV, I can't see the bedside table, I can't see my hands when I'm holding them up in front of my face, but I can sort of see a little bit of movement as my eyes are, as, as my eyes are moving around and mm. looking around the room. I can pick up some movement and some, some blurriness and some shapes and some shadows, but nothing's clear. Uh, and it's very much like literally TV gone, colour gone, uh, majority of things gone. There's just some shapes and shadows but not really knowing exactly what they are. Or And you've gone to bed thinking, oh, you know, this is just a precaution. Mum and dad, it can't be serious because mum and dad have been able to, you know, go home and, and they'll sort you out in the morning. So you've got no, absolutely no idea that this is ab- about to happen. What was going through your head when you woke up? I was honestly... Honestly, looking back now, never once did it cross my mind when I woke up and couldn't see that it was permanent. Yeah. I, I thought maybe there's something going on with the lights in here. Yeah. Maybe this is a side effect of the steroids. Uh, maybe this is something that will uh, let, let me go back to bed for another hour or two and see if I wake up then, um, surely it'll be gone. There was not one moment there that I thought this is permanent, especially when it was just me. In that, in that bed, surrounded by those curtains by myself. It's not like I could run it past someone and say, this is what I can now say, what do you think it is? This was just all internal dialogue going, nah, there's nothing to really worry about. This, this is weird. This is different. I don't know. I'm sort of rubbing my eyes. I'm, I'm putting my head into the pillow and trying to adjust my eyes and, and see if they're going to work soon, but they weren't and uh, never came back. Man, every time I hear that, uh, as I said, um, I've heard Ben speak plenty of times. Um, I, 
I, I can't even imagine what that would have been like from a sensory perspective and I can totally understand when you just said that you didn't think it was permanent. Maybe you've just got a bit, you know, maybe it's a headache kicking in more or the, the drips, you know, had an adverse reaction and everything. At what point, you know, uh, you, they, I'm assuming uh, that they would have called your parents, they would have gone back in, but first and foremost you would have had some sort of nurse come in, I guess you could say, and then what you're relay, relaying that information to her and then my guess is that all uh, hell would have broken loose. Well, the funny part was it wasn't a nurse. Okay. The first person that came in yeah. was one of the one of the ladies that was coming around with the breakfast menu. Yeah, right, of course. For yeah. me to select yeah. what I wanted for breakfast. Yeah. So she comes in with a laminated uh, breakfast menu, yeah. passes it to me and goes, hello, sir, uh, just, uh, just tell me what you'd like off the breakfast menu. Now, we're in the Eye Near Hospital yeah. and we've got a laminated sheet of paper. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's not ideal in the first place yeah. and I'm going, I, I, I can't see the piece of paper. Yeah. But by the time I'm trying to say this and even work out how to say that I can't see it, she's gone. She's like, just tick the just boxes, drop, just just tick the boxes that you want and yeah. uh, I'll come back and collect it in a minute. Yeah. And one of the blokes beside me, in the bed beside me, he's sort of watching and seeing my concerns and he's like, mate, everything all right? I said, I, I don't really know what's happened, but I, I, I can't see the, the menu that the lady's just given me. I, I said, it, like, I, I would have been able to see it last mm. night, but I can't see it now. Yep. And he's like, ah, oh, mate, yeah, I, I, know, I know what that's like. Here, I've got a magnifying glass. Here, uh, use this. You'll be right. Yeah, right. So that must have been what he was in there for. His sight must – he used a magnifying glass to read. He goes, yeah, I've just ordered breakfast. I've just ordered this, 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 this and this. And he gave me his magnifying glass. He goes, oh, it's a real strong one. It's great. Just hold it up there. You'll be, you'll be sweet. And I've held that up and I've gone. Can't see anything. Can't see anything. Shit. This. And you had your phone there. Did you straight away think, I've got to get, I'm, I'm calling my parents. Like what's, you know, what, what's happening here? I, like, I couldn't check the time, couldn't unlock it. I had, I had a passcode on my phone so I couldn't even get in, into the phone. So I couldn't ring anyone. And then eventually the lady came back and goes, oh, you haven't ordered anything for breakfast. I said, oh, I, I can't really Again, I'm trying to just put words to what's going on here without even really knowing how to say, I think my eyesight's gone. Like, I think my eyes aren't working. I, and I'm trying to somehow explain that and put words to it and go, oh, can you tell me what's on it? Because at any, I can't po at any it. point, did you start to panic? Uh, again, there, there, there wasn't a moment there that I thought this is forever. I just thought this is the current situation right now and I'm in hospital, I'm in the best place, they'll, they'll sort it out. There'll be some reason, there'll be some other medication or who knows what. I, I hadn't even thought that far ahead. I was just sort of in the present and trying to order brekkie. Yeah. And <laughs> I was hungry. And fast forward, so we, we, we get to the point where, you know, perhaps people are starting to realise that something, you know, isn't quite right. So you've obviously got your parents in the picture now mm. um, and you've got the doctors that are probably, I'm assuming, pretty frantically trying to find out what, what's, what's happening. Um, talk us through the next steps. Yeah, so doctors come in uh, before my parents got there and they said, so how's everything feeling? All good, we'll, we'll get you ready to go home. And I said, I, I, I don't think everything is all good. I, I can't see you. And they're like, hang on, what, what do you mean you can't see me? And then they sort of bring in the, you know, those classic um, charts that you, you used to use or I don't know, yeah, you probably yeah, still do yeah. use when you go for your car licence or, yeah. or something like that and it's got all the letters, the letters in, yeah. in all the different mm -hmm. sizes. So they bring one of those charts in yeah, right. and they're like, so which line of this chart can you read? And I said, I can't see you and I can't see the chart. So then yeah, they right. went and got another chart with bigger letters. Yeah, they're right. like, can you see any of these letters? And then they're bringing them closer and closer to me and saying, when, when can you read these letters? And I'm like, no, I've got nothing. And then they're saying, can you pick up the movement? And they're literally waving a whole arm in front of my face. And I'm going, I can tell that there's your something. Parent, your parents on the scene by this point? No, no, no. Them. Yep. And I'm saying I, I can tell that there's something movement m moving there, but I, I can't pick up the detail. And they were in shock. And because of their reaction, I think that put me into a bit more of a level of shock because they seemed a lot more concerned. And then mum and dad rocked up not long after. They said, I think they tried to just sort of calm the situation down saying, no, nah, that's okay. Um, sometimes these things happen. I'm like, oh, do they? Do they really? And they're like, well, let's just do a lot more tests and we'll, we'll try and figure out what's going on because 
this is, this is a little bit uh, out of the ordinary. We weren't expecting it, but we will uncover what's going on. It might, may just take us a little while and it may look like we might keep you in for observation over the next few days. And again, they sort of played things down. Pretty calm, pretty cool. We'll just do some tests and we'll figure out what's going on and then we can treat it accordingly. And that was always the, the dialogue, the conversation. Once we figure out what's going on, we'll be able to treat it accordingly. So it sounded like there were some hope themes there, always. It was always like, oh, no, this will be all right. Like, yeah. This is just a small setback. When did you fe- When did you realise, mate? So it was probably probably a week in uh, when I was doing some, some tests uh, and whatnot that one of the doctors said, now, one thing that we're thinking it may be or it could be is, is this condition. Uh, called Leber's hereditary optic neuropathy. There's a few different variations. Uh, the way in which your optic nerves are showing up through this particular test uh, is presenting similar to some photos that we've got uh, of this v- very, very rare genetic condition. And that was just one conversation amongst hundreds and hundreds of conversations that I'm having throughout the, this couple of week period. But in order to know, uh, it could be that, it could be a number of other things. We're going to do some genetic testing. We'll send them off. It'll take a week to get results, yada, yada, yada. week later, we get the phone call. I've eventually been able to go home and they're just saying, we're literally just playing the waiting game for results. And we get the phone call to come back in. We head back in, get sat down, and the doctor delivers the news that it's not what they originally diagnosed it as. It's a rare genetic syndrome, and those words came out called Leber's Hereditary Optic Neuropathy. And he, he said, Ben, I'm sorry to say, mate, but this is incurable. It can't be fixed. You'll be blind for life. So that was uh, that, was that, mate. That, that was the moment. They were the words that turned my world upside down, uh, crushed those childhood hopes and dreams of being a helicopter pilot. I, I don't think that would be a wise idea. <laughs> Absolutely not. But did you, you know, that, that's such a, a powerful thing to hear. Mm. Um, and there must have been a billion thoughts running through your head. And obviously it's went straight to your hopes and dreams and everything like that. Um, how did your parents handle that? Uh, they, they burst into tears, to be completely honest. And I, I talked at the start about my old man yeah, being, being that, that tough character. It was the first time in my entire life that I'd ever heard my dad cry. Yeah. And to the point that... I don't really talk about this. I haven't really talked about this. When dad was crying, I thought he was joking. Like you, in a really yeah, weird you way. Couldn't, you couldn't because see him. because yeah. I was sort of in shock. Yeah. Not 100% there with it all over the place probably looking back now. And I'm going, I'm saying to mum, is, it, is he for real? Mum's going, y- yes. Yeah, yeah, you would have just been out of your, but almost an out of body experience. Get, and I'm just, going, yeah. Come on, Dad, it's not that big of a deal. Come on, Mum, I've just lost my eyesight. Let's yeah. get on with it. I'm, I'm sort of thinking in that moment that if Dad's crying, I've got to, I've got to pick this shit back up. Yeah. Like, Dad doesn't cry. If yeah. Dad's crying, this isn't good. But we need to get on with this. And 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 I'm trying to go. Come on, guys, not a big deal. And I thought if if I cry, they're going to see me crying. That's going to make them cry more. And it's so just, you're just <laughs> trying to support them in that moment. And trying to put on this sort of brave face uh, without knowing that that was necessarily what I was doing. If I seem like I'm okay with it, hopefully that will help them seem that everything's going to be okay. Even though I didn't know whether it was going to be or not or what the impact was going to be like, what it was going to be like to live not being able to see, none of that had computed yet. But I just wanted to – I just felt awkward because Dad was crying. That tough guy in my life was crying and that was weird. Yeah. So I was like whatever I can do – to stop this stereotypical tough guy crying, I'll do. Yeah. That that that's literally was my way of thinking. Yeah, and and so you've got this situation where your life has changed uh, forever. Um, you have, I'm assuming you've you've not had experience or met anyone that's you know be, been visually impaired or lost their eyesight altogether. What's the what's the roadmap out of there, mate? Like, what do you, what are the steps to actually? You know, I'm assuming 16 years old. What do you do? How do you go back to school, mate? Like, you know, what what the hell are you are you going to do there? Like, what are you going to go back to school? What are you going to study? How are you going to study? Then you start thinking about what braille and stuff like that. Is that something that you have to do? What was the actual steps out of that? I had no idea. No, I had absolutely no idea what the steps were, other than let's get back to normal. I yeah. think I think that was. That was the thing that part everyone of the, part of the denial and part of the shock sort of thing. That, that's yeah, and, and everyone around me was going, 
let's just get back being back to normal life because that's going to help the most. Let's get things back to normal. So mum, like mum, dad, my mates, my basketball coach was saying, oh, yeah, Ben can still train for basketball and he, he can still come along. To, I'm like, H- how? How? How am I going to train on the basketball court when there's this ball flying around that I can't see and when there's people running around that I can't see? And it was just get back to normal life and get back to the way things used to be, even though everything was so different. And I was back at school. I think everyone wanted me to get back to school from a social point of view, even though it was very much we don't know how Ben's going to learn yet. Um, Obviously, he's not going to be able to see what is on the board, read the textbooks, write the notes, do anything like that. But let's just, from a social point of view, get him around his mates because the last thing we need is Ben waiting in his bedroom until we get everything sorted. So let's sort things along the way. Uh, would, have been, would have been a lot for your mates to take in as well. Oh, 100%. I mean, that was one thing that took me a while, to be honest, uh, to recognise was my parents had never had a child, mm. obviously, yeah. that was blind. I'd, my sister had never been a sister to a brother that was blind. My mates had never been mates to a mate that was blind. And I think Te- when you go through never, that, yeah. Probably never taught someone maybe. No, 100%. Teachers have never taught someone. And, and they said that, my mates said that, but they didn't, weren't necessarily saying it until I recognised that it wasn't just me going through this. This was affecting everybody around me. And as much as I was uncertain about everything, so was everyone else. There was treading on eggshells and, mate, it was, a, it was a daily battle, this roller coaster ride of adjusting and adapting to, to life now. And it was actually some of the smallest things that were the most frustrating that would give you the shits. Like what? Like I, I clearly remember coming home from hospital and knowing my way around the house because it's, it's where I lived and I was able to navigate uh, with my limited, limited, very, very, very limited um, sort of shapes and shadows to the cupboard that we kept the cups. So I grabbed a cup because I was thirsty, went to the kitchen sink, felt the kitchen sink, felt the tap, put the cup under the tap, that wasn't too bad, turn the tap on and I hear, you know how that sort of, the noise changes a little bit and then all of a sudden the water's going over the top of the cup onto my hand, I'm getting a wet hand, I'm going, well, that's full but that's annoying. Mm. How do I know when to stop? And that's one tiny little example of this mundane daily task Mm. that we all do as people that we don't think about, we don't sit there and go, Okay, now when I need to pour a cup of water, what I'm going to do is I'm going to yeah, fold it's my just fingers around. Second nature. Yeah, you just do it without yeah, thinking, yeah, right? Absolutely. And there were, everything I did without thinking, all of a sudden it was sinking in that I now had to think about all of these things. Mm. And it was those little things. Like I knew that getting around independently was going to be this huge challenge, but I didn't really count on all of these tiny, tiny little daily tasks. Uh, that we do without thinking, adding up to cause so much sort of frustration. 16 years old, um, carrying something as heavy as that uh, on your shoulders, mm. your mental health, um, emotionally, you know, your thinking, uh, where were you at? Yeah, uh, not great. I think, I think the first, first few months was denial and denial to the point that because for 16 years of my life, 365 days a year, every day I'd been able to wake up, open my eyes and just see the world. So I didn't sink in straight away, even after that diagnosis, a couple of weeks after being in hospital for the first time. Even after that, I'm waking up in the morning and opening my eyes and going, fuck, that's right. Mm. Like I'm expecting to be able to see yep. and I can't. Yep. And that was this pattern over and over again. Like surely one day this, this will all just go away. Like I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a pretty pretty realist. Like you know that I'm pretty black yeah, and white. Yep. But at the same time, I couldn't help that fact of waking up and going, oh, my, oh, not today. Yeah. Like it just wasn't sinking in straight away because it, was, it wasn't natural. And in terms of my mental health, I didn't realise that what I did in that hospital room by putting on that brave face – when mum, but more specifically dad, broke down, I created a habit and I created a pattern that the best way for me and everyone else to get through this, because everyone else was upset, they were all worried about me, they were all asking, is everything okay, how are you coping today, is everything... 
the best way that I figured out to cope with it was just put on that brave face. Yeah, bottle it up. And just go, no, nah, I'm all good. That's sweet. Yeah, it's no big deal. Don't worry about it. The amount of times that I used the phrase, no big deal. Yeah. Uh, was. Do you think you believed it or do you think it's something that you knew uh, that you were bullshitting yourself and everybody else? Uh, do you reckon you believed it or was it, is it, is it kind of like you needed to for your own mental health and to keep yourself up and to not help falling in a heap, you needed to sort of continue to tell that lie? I think it was a band-aid approach that I was wanting and trying to believe. Yeah. But I knew deep down that I didn't believe it. I want to know when, when was the moment that changed, Ben? Like when did you accept it? Like when did you sit there and go, right, this is something I can't change because obviously, you know, I've been through a similar, very different situation, similar situation. There's, there's, that, there's that moment where it all sort of hits home and you go, right, you know, now I've got to make a decision. Mm. You know, this is, this is the day, right? When was that moment that you actually had where you just said, okay, I'm blind? There was a couple of moments. Uh, there was a couple of moments and there was one that I realised that I was blind and then there was another moment that it sort of kept going down that same path that I was talking about of putting on that brave face. So the first moment was one thing I absolutely hate more than most things in the entire world, poles. Fucking hate poles. Yeah. Like absolutely hate poles. I don't discriminate. Poles don't discriminate against me. <laughs> Big poles, short poles, tall poles, skinny poles, wide poles. Yep. Like all the poles, uh, I absolutely hate them because yep. I end up running into them. Uh, they're not easy for a cane to pick up. And I was also in denial, not really using a cane because I was embarrassed. I didn't want people to see sure. me using yeah. a white cane. So I ran into a shitload of poles and pole number one, I don't like admitting how many poles I'm up to now. I think I've stopped counting. It was easier to stop counting, but pole number one was very memorable for all of the wrong reasons. And I was walking into school, still in denial, a few months after losing my eyesight and outside the main office in the main thoroughfare that every single kid at my school walked through. I have ran headfirst into this pole on this main thoroughfare and it has cracked me perfectly, eyebrow, cheek, lip, split it all open, blood pouring down onto my school uniform. I've dropped to the bottom of the pole and it was then and there for the first time since I was diagnosed that I've gone, this is real. Yeah. Like, this is real. I need to accept this, but I'm not happy about it. Yeah. So I think that was the first moment. Yeah. Um, second moment? Second moment was yes, I had accepted it was real, but I wasn't bloody happy about it. And I continued, even at the bottom of that pole, people come rushing up and going, are you okay, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine, leave me alone, all yeah. good. Yeah, And get off me. Yeah, 100%. And I continued that probably even stronger, even harder from that moment. I was like, I, there's going to be things that happen like this. To get pretty angry. But I need to push people. Oh, 100%, 100%. And I... Cracked it, pushed people away, continue to push people away, but also put on that brave face. Like the pushing people away sort of ebbed and flowed, but also I didn't want to continue to push people away because I wanted to seem like everything was normal. It wasn't until a couple of years I'd continue this pattern, didn't realise how much shit I was just bottling up and this brave face of always saying to people, no, I'm sweet, it's no big deal. I mean, look at me, I'm fine, it's all good. You know, nothing worries me. It was just those standard sayings to get people off my back. But it was interesting how people just accept that as well. Mm. Because people started to realise every time they asked Ben, how is he? No, he's sweet. And they probably walked away thinking, God, he's amazing, isn't yeah. he? He's amazing the way he's I, doing I don't know what they were stuff. thinking, but maybe, you know, yeah. Yeah, because you're just, you're just, you know, you're fine. He seems to be dealing with it fine, but deep down, not the case. Mm. But the mental health, mate, uh, really got challenged. Uh, over two years after I lost my eyesight, start of year 12, was able to get back to doing some of the things that I enjoyed before losing my eyesight. One of those was water skiing. Went water skiing with, uh, with the family up to Lake Eildon and went out to do a left-hand turn. This was the weekend before year 12 was about to start. And the ski has slipped out from underneath me, had nothing to do with not being able to see. Front of the skis got caught in the water, spun around, broken every bone in my ankle. Uh, not that I knew that at the time, but I knew it bloody hurt. And I ended up heading back to get it, getting in the boat, pulling the, pulling the foot out of the boot was the most 
painful thing I've ever been through in my entire life. Uh, I think all of Lake Eildon and, and uh, the surrounding 50 <laughs> kilometres heard that scream. And uh, then the, the painful boat ride back for an hour to the boat ramp, over every wave, uh, two-hour car, tr- car trip, straight to the hospital. Uh, and then we get into hospital and eventually do some surgery after a week, waiting for the inflammation to go down and whatnot. And uh, we got out of surgery and had the moon boot on. Doctors come in. Before, I, before they were letting me go home, they said, now, most people that break their ankle will go on crutches. But because you can't go on crutches, uh, because you use a cane, we're going to put you in a wheelchair. Now, wheelchair is still not ideal because you can't use your cane. Your, your broken ankle is the thing that's going to stick out furthest from this wheelchair. So we don't actually want you to go anywhere either. We just want you to hang at home uh, because that's probably the safest place for you. You'll be able to do some of your schoolwork from there and whatever and mum is working with teachers to sort of work that sort of stuff out. And I was like, yep, cool. If that's, if that's what I have to do, that's what I have to do. Again, didn't sort of think too much about it. And that's how I spent pretty much the whole first term of year 12. Uh, I spent that at home in a wheelchair by, my, by myself for a lot of that time. And I spent my 18th birthday the same way and continued to put on that brave face. Even though you, you sort of don't have a great day when you're doing that day in, day out and you spend so much time inside your head. And it wasn't until a few days later that uh, my old man came in uh, from, from work, same, same as he did every day, uh, same as mum did. They popped their head in the bedroom. I was up on the bed and he said, hey, mate, how was your day? Yeah, good. How was yours? All good. And we talked about the footy and work and, and how his day was and, yeah, what's on for the weekend? And he goes, yeah, you know, just, just want to make sure, like, everything all good. And I said, yeah, nah, Dad, you, don't, you know, things don't worry me. I'm fine. Mm. Like, this will be over before you know it. And same tune. Yeah, same tune. Brave face, bottle it up. And just before he left, he sort of looked back and he said, Mate, you sure you're all good? And I don't know why he asked. I don't know what clicked inside him or what clicked inside me, but I burst into tears for the first time since losing my eyesight. Yeah, right. And it all came out at once. Like this bottle was that full yeah. of two years of build-up emotion, frustration, anger, hurt, resentment. Everything was in this bottle and it has just come pouring yeah. out and I'm going... Dad, this is shit, this sucks, this is fucked, I hate this, I wish I wasn't blind, like I hate every single part of this. How and this is just he, how true How did he respond? I think he was in shock. Yeah. Because to him, I was coping. Yeah. All everyone saw was Ben coping. Ben coped really well. Yeah. And and he just came and sat and put, put his arm down on me and around me and he just said, mate, I, I can't imagine. He goes, I... Cannot imagine what you go through every single day. How'd you feel? Light mm. in a really weird way. Mm. Like as angry, as frustrated, as hurt, as sad, as upset as I was, I actually felt light for the first time since I was diagnosed because everything I was bottling up, so I didn't realise how much it was actually weighing me down Yeah, and how, how much effort and energy it took to continually put on a brave face and, and try and get through shit by myself. And that moment sort of taught you a really valuable lesson? Oh. Did you make a decision that day is sort of not let yourself get to that point again? Well, that may – and I think I recognised from that day the value of speaking up and how important it is to let other people in. And, and it's not a sign of weakness because of how good it felt for somebody else to understand it. And from there I was able to talk to mates about it, to mum about it, to my sister about it, and not the same way, not in that – angry, frustrated, through tears, but actually talk about some of the things that were really getting to me, some of the things that really frustrate me on a, on a daily basis, all those moments. And then from then on, I didn't have to let two years of bottled up emotion and frustration, hurt and anger out. Yeah. I could actually just pop, talk about that day. Pop a, popping off a bit of steam, mate. Yeah, like exactly. A, like a whale coming to the surface. 100%. Mate. Absolutely, yeah. So you, so you learned that valuable skill uh, and you've taken that with you. And uh, now... Knowing you, uh, you're very mature for your age. Uh, still a pretty young pup, but you um, you got a family now. Um, you've learned to to use some of those really valuable lessons, and that one in particular with your dad, uh, to cope 
and uh, and to get through life and to achieve not just to, to cope. I would probably use a bad word, but not just to cope, but to thrive. Um, talk us through that. Let us know a little bit about, you know, what do you do on a regular basis to manage your mental health and to get through um, challenges that not everybody um, out in life uh, has to deal with on a daily basis? What do you do? Uh, it's a it's a tough one uh, because I'll be completely honest and go. It is one thing that as life changes, I'm coming up against new challenges. And uh, just when I thought that I had it all figured out, living by myself, not in a relationship at 19 years old, I I was going, right, I've got my life at the moment worked out and things are pretty seamless as much as there's always challenges and frustrations. And then all of a sudden there was a long distance relationship thrown in there. Bang. And and that came with a whole nother set of challenges. And when I say challenges, challenges physically from the point of view that all of these things that I wished I could do, wanted to be able to do, couldn't do because of not being able to see, that then impacted my mental health. And then throw the next banner in the works of of having a little girl and going, this little girl deserves a dad that can see. And and having that that that, go. All that that doubt about self-worth and those sorts of things. mate, huge. And and does the word burden pop up? Burden pops up, I think. Also burden, but then the, the other side, I'm also very conscious and always have been of, what I feel and believe that the people around me deserve. Mm. And, yeah, I, I, I suppose it is connected very closely with burden, but say for my daughter who's uh, 18 months old, like she's not looking at, at dad going, oh, he's a burden, but I go, well, I wish I could do so much more with her than I, than I can. And from a mental health point of view, what do I do uh, to try and manage that? Because that's the shit that I'm dealing with every day and trying to juggle and, and manage so that it's not getting me down. Uh, and there's moments that it does, absolutely. There's days that it does. There's days that I go, I wish I could see. Uh, that's not all the time, uh, but that is, that is definitely still some of the time and it, and it changes, it goes up and down. But in terms of what I do, one of the things that I absolutely love, my two dogs, two Kelpies, and the good thing with me and taking the dogs for a walk is it's not like I can – get out there and chuck a podcast in or some music on because I can't see where he is. So I need to be listening. I've got a couple of metal discs on his collar so that they jingle um, and then obviously just very much in tune to to that. So I'm quite at one with nature, as weird as that sounds, um, which I absolutely love. And whether it's for 15 minutes, half an hour or an hour, try to do that hour as much as I can of a morning. And the non-negotiable for you. The good thing is doesn't matter whether it's daytime or nighttime. Uh, can't tell the difference anyway. So... Uh, daylight savings or not, I, I take the dog for a walk and that uh, I know that if I uh, stop doing that or get out of that habit even for three or four days or a week, yeah. my mental health goes down. Goes down. Um, so that is one thing I do to refill my tank, mate. And on top of that, I remember a little while back thinking you're an absolute uh, lunatic, I would have thought, because um, you go bike riding. Uh, around near where you live, um, get on the mountain bike and go for a bit of a ride. Um, doesn't always doesn't always end well. <laughs> uh, yeah, and then I remember you sending a, 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 this crazy story about. Tell us about you you, uh, you were going for a bike ride um, and you sent a, a photograph um, after a bike ride uh, to your wife. Yeah, you did. Or you just going for a walk? You're out there walking around and. Ah uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh so, well, that, see the. Problem is, mate, I've got that many scars from running into shit, <laughs> falling off shit. Uh, Hard it, to remember. Uh, that's it. So the bike, I had one, uh, used to live near a pony club and yeah. I was riding through this pony club that yeah. I knew from when I could see. Uh, like still still live quite locally to where I grew up. Yeah. And I'm riding through this area thinking that I remember where all these horse jumps are. Yeah. And I've, I've just come across this one that wasn't a horse jump that was built up out of the ground, yeah. it was the horses had to jump over this huge dug in metre deep ditch. Uh, so I'm just riding along going, oh, yeah, I think I remember this. This is all good. And then I've just gone nice and slow straight into this uh, ditch that was meant to be a horse jump. Oh, I did not jump the horse jump. Yeah, right. Uh, my face didn't jump the horse jump and uh, took, a, took a fair bit of bark off, off the skin. So I've walked back into the house uh, that day with – uh, a hat on and a hoodie on, trying to hide all hide this all. Scar, <laughs> all, all this skin that and bark that I've taken off the off the head. Uh, so that was funny. And eventually, uh, when I was having a shower, going to bed like three or four hours later, Amy's like, "What the hell have you done?" I was like, 
what? She's like, what has happened? And uh, same thing happened when I was taking the dog for a walk, slipped off the side of the track and uh, ended up impaling my leg on a star picket. Yeah, uh, I still remember the photo. It's like, it's it's gruesome. Uh, <laughs> it, it looks like it's I never saw four, it. four centimetres deep and you just carried on, didn't you? You carried on walking and... Uh, well, the problem was Amy was in Europe. Yeah, so, I remember you had to send a photo just to say, hey, is there anything wrong with my leg? Because yeah. you, could, you could probably feel it was, was something, like, something will, going will, on. Will this be right in the morning? Stitch, uh, stitch you up 15 stitches thing. later. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it turns out. And for anyone thinking how hard that might be, just like simply going for a walk, um, you know, just using mind memory to get around, um, try riding a bike. Um, no, you know, don't try riding a but bike for, for, if for, you're blind. For anyone, <laughs> you know, wondering how hard that is, like, I rem- you know, we were on a recent trip. I remember walking into a school and I closed my eyes just to see what that would be like for Ben. And I just walk around sort of flinching the whole time and I don't know what that would even be like but um, your ability to get around uh, now uh, many many years later um, is just incredible Uh, watching you navigate uh, your ability to remember things um, and to go out there and like you said ride along um, without being able to see uh, with your dogs or or even just to walk along is pretty incredible so um, but but obviously pretty important for your mental health as you said yeah absolutely mate time time definitely mate doesn't make things go away um, but it definitely does help things become more normal um, and, and things do get easier with time. Uh, so yeah, regaining some of that independence, that confidence and also that stupidity just to go, you know what, uh, let's let's give bike riding a crack. And probably the one other thing just to touch on um, with refilling my tank, I think the walking the dog thing is really important from a regularity and consistency point of view, but also love um, post-broken ankle, post-recovery, post um, still getting out with the family and water skiing being behind that boat, holding on to that, that handle out there because as long as I'm holding on to that handle, I'll be following the boat. That's sort, that's sort of how the whole concept works and that is probably one of, the, one of the major times in my life when I'm behind a boat that I don't think about not being able to see and, and it, I don't feel like it affects me, I don't feel like it impacts me and that's when all of that stuff goes away. So that's the other thing that's awesome for my mental health, but I need to need to make sure I'm doing both. I can't just hang out for the next time I go water skiing because over winter and whatnot, that could be in six months' time. That's too long That's too long to wait to not be doing something in between uh, to refill that tank. Yeah, I love what you said before about you know being one with nature. Like it's as, as corny or as that sound or whatever, but just getting out there um, and, and doing that you know, on a regular basis. And, and if you don't, um, it can have some some impact on your mental yeah, health. Yeah, well, that, that awesome saying that um, we reel off from time to time, yeah. if you're feeling blue, touch green. Yeah, well, love that's that. That's a great one. Absolutely, yeah, 100%. Benny, love to throw some quick fire questions at you as we always do with our guests and uh, you're no different. Um, to, so today I'd love to right. throw a few things at you. So here we I'm go, ready. Are you ready to go? Yeah, let's All right, stop. so schnitty or steak for you? Schnitty if I can turn it into a palmer. Right, okay, good one, like it. And uh, potty, uh, book or tunes? Um, that's a tough one, isn't it? Nah, not a tough one no. for me, mate. Music, tune, 100%, country yep. music, addict. and Favourite artist? Oh, mate, there is many. Uh, Morgan Wallen, Hardy, Eric Church, number of them, absolutely love them. But I think the thing for me is when you can't see, uh, music to me is my landscape. Uh, so many people get pissed off with me because I literally walk around with either an AirPod or my phone playing music the whole time. Yes. And the, the reason I love country music tells a story that creates sort of that landscape for me that I miss out on um, not being able to see. Yeah, absolutely. Love it. Uh, where do you go to switch off, mate? Where do I go to switch off? I would say to the river. Um, to the river, by the water, camping. Worst advice you've ever been given about your mental health? Worst advice I've ever been given? Um, I probably gave it to myself, to be honest. No <laughs> yeah. big deal. I gave, no big I gave deal. it to everyone else. And yeah, You mentioned you said that. You were the, you, that was your, that was your favourite go. I'd be to. I'd be a millionaire if I if I had a dollar for every time I said no big deal to someone. So I don't know if that, that counts as uh, the correct answer, but I would say that I gave myself the worst advice I've ever been given. Yeah. Best advice. Best advice uh, I would say would be to not bottle it up and to let someone in. I think. I think that uh, piece of advice, I think we touched on it in, in an earlier episode, which is that, that problem shared is a problem halved is, is so true. Yeah. And, and just being able to, to let somebody in um, is, is so, so valuable. I didn't realise the value until I, until I did it. That's, that's, if, if I have one regret in my entire life, it's not speaking up sooner. Yeah, love that. Benny, uh, we're great mates. Um, I love 
listening to you tell your story, um, I'm honestly, I'm honest when I say that, um, you know, watching you go about life um, in spite of a circumstance that you had no control over is always inspiring. I know that you hate that word, um, but it is, it is inspiring. You said before something that sticks out to me. Um, you were worried about, you know, what you, what it's going to be like to be a dad and whether you can be enough. And I, I certainly uh, know that you are more than capable and um, and someone that I think is 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 such a, a magnificent uh, father, a magnificent husband to Amy. Um, and you just go about uh, living your life with with such um, uh, pride and, um, and and putting uh, emphasis on uh, being resilient um, given all that you've been through. Um, I think it's fantastic, mate, and it's a, it's a pleasure to be your mate. Um, I'd love to to cap uh, this podcast off with asking you, knowing what you've been through, um, thinking about how you used to view uh, what it means to be tough um, in your formative years when you're a young fella. I'd love to hear what your definition of being tough is now. My definition, mate, of being tough now, knowing what I know, knowing what I've learnt the hard way, is having having the awareness to proactively and regularly tip that bottle out before it gets too full. Thanks for listening today. And uh, if it struck a chord, uh, don't forget, um, life's tough for all of us. So if you're struggling, um, talk to your mate. And if you're still struggling, please call Lifeline 13 11 14. Thanks for tuning in. Everything you've heard in today's episode will be in the show notes below where you click to play this episode. While you're there, why not chuck us a subscribe or follow. Catch you next time.